It's a good morning to you. Welcome to Asaki Online. My name is Zenzel Ndevele and this is the Breakfast Club. Uh, once in a while or once a week we bring you a historical installment where we talk to former members of uh, Zipra, Zapu. The idea being we want to enrich our history to understand what happened in the liberation struggle because uh, so if we don't know where we come from. We might not appreciate some of the things uh, that are happening and we might not know where we are going. So it is important to understand our history but also to pay uh, you know, particular uh, re serious respect to those who played a big role in the history of the liberation struggle. Uh, my school days I, I learned history and sometimes the history that I learned to school, uh, I mean the history that I learned at school and the history that I'm now getting, I find that there's a lot uh, of difference. There are a lot of things that we have not been told uh, in the history books and there are a lot of heroes who played a very big role in liberating our country that have been ignored. So this is the main reason why we, we, we look for people in Zipra, Zapu to understand their role to tell us what happened. And if you know any other person, a friend, a father, a cousin, a relative who was in Zipra or Zapu, let us know so that we can get uh, in contact with them and also get their history. It is important that they tell their own story because no one is going to tell their story uh, better than them. So they tend to misrepresent you. But you won't be having that chance to actually respond. But this time around we're saying, we want to sit down with them. They tell our history so that their families, their kids, their grandchildren can also know this is the role that they played. And we always get, uh, we are proud when we know what our our, our parents did. So in, pro, in the program today, we'll be talking to Ukla, uh, Douglas Malikwa. Uh, his war name was Malo Momosebe, but also known as Chang. He's a former uh, Zipra uh, combatant and we want to talk to him about uh, the history of the liberation struggle and his role uh, in the liberation struggle. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, I think I'll, I'll start by saying, Eli, you can just tell us, uh, when did you join the liberation struggle? I joined the liberation struggle in 1976. I crossed alone to Botswana through, I don't know that place now, Ratla schools. I arrived at Celebi Pukwe prison where I met some of the Zimbabweans who were already going to join the struggle. I think that time there were some Zipracators who were coming from Mozambique. That's where I first met one guy whose name was Mkize. Then one Savile, that Savile guy was also coming from Kwana but he had already trained. I met John Yampingisa when we were about to fly to to Zambia. I said, let me pick with there were some youngers there. I don't know what those youngers for. That is where I fit Mr. John Yampingis. So which year was this? Seven six. Okay. So Usuge Zambia Lapo Usuge Potsana, you go to Zambia? Yes, I went to Zambia. Okay. Then in Zambia, we were taken to Nampundu camp where we started our training. That was in 1976. Our instructors, they were... Skoki was there, I think Jake Mpof was also there. I may not remember that as well. Nampundu was said to have been evacuated by Zanda, Sami or Yesbeki. So after Nampund, we, we then went to Membesh, where normally referred to as the first group in Membesh. They were joined by many structures, some who were taught it to remain Tanzania, Morokoro. Then after Zipa, they came back to Zambia, they were part of our structures. And some of my structures, as I can still remember, now the city of General Pivis Band. And we also had led Stanley Kakisa. 
Zephyrus Kupi is late Shatrix band. Then the late Rotu Nyega, General Colin Moyo. Dr. Mbeya was our medical, our medical chief. He's called to it Chomur, I think. So, otherwise, we're one of the lucky groups in Zipra that we also had the vice president, let's just say, Moyo, who would visit us. He could take Blackboard and chalk stand in front of us, teaching us what the revolution is. It was very sad that he, we lost him. And it took time for the camp commander then, Skoke, to call the recruits and inform us of his death. It was a sad day. I have heard so many stories about UJZ, mm -hmm. uh, especially, you know, Stechasake, Umundoy, Hani, you know, why liberation, why, why, very, you know, as strong it was in today's liberation. Lina, we interact with why Umundonja? I think to us, recruits, as he, I think he came two or three times to our camp. He was a simple man. You could discuss with us, you could go to the kitchen, take his own plate and go in the kitchen and be served. When we were looking at him like that. There was not a person who would sit down and call for all things to come in his favor. He was a down to earth man. So you really had quite a partner training, uh, Lina, when I deployed to Zimbabwe? No, when we finished our training, I was one of those who were chosen to go for further military training in the then Soviet, Euro Soviet Union, and that was the Ukraine at Simpropo, where I did the company commander's course. They did not call it infant, but a motorized infantry commanders, because as you can be made aware that some of those armies are developed, they don't have soldiers that walk or fight on foot, they fight, they fight on vehicles. So we did the motorized command commanders course. I think we were many, some, some of the guys were did artillery, field artillery, 120 millimeter motors, gun 57, and a cruise, and the, we also have the, the anti team, anti. aircraft missiles. And someone to Odessa to do the battalion and the battalion commanders course and battalion commissars or the commissars course. Uh, you know, I think if just to link your, your training, I think it was your unit, uh, so Zimbabwe up around Wange, where I think you had to pull a spotter plane in Makio. Was it your unit? Yeah, no, <coughs> it happened at the, one of the camps in Zambia, we call the camp Foxo. It was during the rotation bombardment in Zambia. <coughs> Actually, what happened uh, a day before bombardment came, information came that uh, the president, Joshua Nkong, was to visit our camps. In our camp came one of the senior Zipro commanders who was Mastrata. I'd forgotten to mention his name. That is Charles Reynolds who became Brigadier Craig at one. The one who came to our camp to arrange for the president's visit. And for sure the president was coming. I'm very sad because some people have tried to misinterpret all that. When 
My crane was calm. Let the brigadier cry. We were to move from our camp to near the Zambia Great Estuary, where we were to wait for the president's address. Because we were with two or three camps almost around that general area. So in our case, we were commanded by the late Silas Chengera. He became Major Silas Moye at home. So we suggested to Brigadier Gray that we take anti acres. That was a suggestion. It was agreed. We pulled uh, the weapons to the area. Some people slept all around the position. Others came in the morning. But it was the same day that the FC was bombed and the Mkush was bombed. So when the rotation just came, people thought it may be so the Zambian Air Force is escorting the, the Zap president. But maybe some that I think what maybe was coming by helicopter or what? Or he was on the ground just escorting him. Like enough for the anti air crews fired at the rotation chest and they dispersed. And those, within some seconds, Roto Zambia announced the bombardment of FC and Mkush. Then everyone then realized that uh, there was the real war now. So the end, a cruise fired again when they retained they did not give us any casualties. Actually we never had any casualties there. So in the evening I was tasked by the commander Silas Moy. I was commanding the first detachment of that camp which was named JZ Detachment. I went back to camp to close the camp. I still remember from <coughs> that camp again, there was one of my instructors, Rupin, who was a signaler. We were not long in that camp, as we had been taken to that camp to take up units there. From one camp that did the first arrivals from Angola. So as I went back, we had about two or three weeks without food. We were relying on skimmed milk and some dried fish. So such so as we some of the week. So as I went back, it was the following day, I was cut off from the main boat. But I remember two helicopters came, they were fired it, but uh, we did not check. Because Zambia is almost uh, having some thick forest, something like rainforest. So they fired at the uh, evening, they brought us food. Because uh, I think by then now the headquarters was aware of what was happening. Food was sent to us. We were fit at the position before we joined the main port. So I was then told by Salas himself that the anti air crews have expended all the ammunition. So we were to change the position again. So we moved, we joined others. And I can't remember where the places, but we went to a position where we spent the whole day. Under, under cover. We could hear the rotation, spotter plane, <coughs> and just flying. So we kept put. So when we moved from that position, I remember meeting the then deputy chief of operations, Richard Matawar. He's Richard Nguyenya. He is known as Dr. Nguyenya. 
I was then proved that we have been resupplied. We moved to a position where we established a base. As we established that base, the following morning the rotation came. Um, I had one crew and a crew commander. It was called Trinos. I think that guy is now in Wangi. I went to his position. The guy we almost grew together at home. But he was ahead of me. His real name is Edward Tinsloff. So normally when the just came, I went to him. We used to say, no, you cover me on the ground. You will say I will cover you on the air. And we had also anticipated some, some paratroppings. I went to his position. It was a gun placement position, a higher position. So a spotter plane came. I was watching it, visually watching it, almost direct to my detachment position, that poster plane was shot down. It was normally referred to as the Green Little Spotter plane. I could see it changing course, started producing some smoke, then there was fire coming out, then it went down. I still remember the following day I was Send for a clearance patrol. I took two of my platoons. We saw a, a wingspan and a, a plane wingspan and some pandoliers. It never occurred to me that I'd take those things. So I came back and reported to Silas Chengera. He then said, no, go and pick those things. We went back to pick those things. Was to say those things are wanted by the headquarters at Lusa. And I still remember very well that those things were used and the press briefings by the president. Unfortunately, of course, some people are now writing to have been there, so that's not true. There are, there are two uh, issues that I want to ask you about this. Interview. Yes, yes. Um, there is the, I think, the shooting of a guy out of Maseka, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Is this, it the same incident? You know? Yeah, it was. On the same day, after the Rhodesians has moved out, because we, they were denied to bomb our camp. I remember we, there was a very big, almost a meter or so bomb that did not explode, and some of those around cluster bomb that did not explode. So, by the way, Tucha is put up in the line with my planes away. Yeah, of course, yeah. So I'm just tried, but our air crews were very good. If I think of those guys, I wonder why we did not make it here. We defeated the Rhodesians. We, we, I will say we, we really won that battle. So what happened with Masega? I was caught from my position by one of sellers. Chenjerai Sarana that he wanted to he wanted me to talk to to Masega. Masega became a Lieutenant Colonel at Independence here. Then he moved from the army to Air Force with the same rank of uh, wing commander as equivalent rank. So what happened really on the day in question? As I started talking to Masega, there was a shot fired at Masega. Up to now, I really don't know whether the shot was intended for him or for me, I really don't know. But I was, I was very close to him when we were talking, very close. He was shot on his face, near the nose. He fell down. I woke him up and they called for assistance. The medics came and took him. I went back to my my position and that was over I, so I, I i never saw him again so what did you know 
No, was I went to him alone. Uh -huh. I found him. He, he was inside a Land Rover. He came out of a Land Rover. As we were talking, he shot him. Whether that guy who shot him was one of the Zebra guys or someone from the enemy, I really don't know. To tell you the truth. Maybe in such instant, really, maybe an investigation was to be done promptly, but no investigation was done. So to really say we were shot by one of the Zebra guys or one of the enemy guys that was within, I really don't know. I, I, I will blame to you. But uh, uh, I mean, I'm but he had came to withdraw some, according to his own statement to me. He wanted to withdraw some anti-air guns for redeployment. And the, the situation was tense. And that time, maybe troops would have appreciated additional weapons than someone taking weapons out. Yeah, it but, was really a precarious yeah. situation. So it, it was, I mean, <coughs> uh, uh, um, just reading from different accounts. So there were there were incidents. Were there incidents where Abandwe Zebra who target their own? Mm, maybe starting from the first shooting of the Zebra commander Negita Mangena at FC. I wouldn't deny that, but maybe Egamasega would have been the the second one. But these people were never caught. What about the Mangena? What the Buluma said? And no one knows what's going on. No, the Mangena. I think for the Zipro commander, really. Some people say those people were caught. On that day, I, I wasn't there. They were caught, but where did they go? I really don't know. But when you hear it as a yes, I cannot confirm or deny it. But for Masega, really, who were the two of us talking? Then a short camp. In a camp, yes, the program. Yeah, in a zip camp. So clearly, if it was an enemy, then he would have shot more shots than just one. <laughs> so on, on, only one shot was was five fired at him. Then there's also the, the uh, there's an incident where it's referred with your, your detachment or your, your company uh, attempted or arrested Richard Matahori. What was that all about? Uh, no, really, I didn't know about that until I started making an argument with the Ivan Swana when he talked about his battalion coming to, to guard us fighting the enemy. There was nothing like that. So as I was phoned by Richard Matauro on the same day, Richard Matauro told me that he was not arrested, but he, those guys wanted to take the case from him. But maybe he was talking of the, the headquarters guys where the, the commander Silas was. Our chief of staff was this J.J. Spanda, the, the helicopter man. I, I, after both, I was so, I know it is sense to, to have on the statement that Richard was arrested, but I knew he was not arrested. When I made contact with Richard, he was just walking along the road with his AK. I, I, I greeted him, but I knew he was our chief of operations, and he did not show any signs. But later when I talked to Richard, he confirmed to me that he was not arrested. Instead, they wanted to take his Land Rover keys. But that was not made known to, to me in person. But he said, no, they didn't do anything to me. They all only wanted to take the keys from me. So when Richard said that to me, at one stage, I was phoned the Bonapas number, it was not going through. I came here to Ploy, I checked him. I found him in one of the places between that SDHH 
and this school, what do they call that space? Pampregin. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. where I found him. So I really asked him, what did he do on the day in question? Because I was saying, no, it wasn't him wanted to take the keys from Richard Matauri, a patient one. Kopoga, he was one of the Komsa that we found in that camp. But Kopoga is late. He was telling me that Kopoga died at Nambonde during Bobankman. So really to say, the whole unit arrested Matauri or ill-treated Matauri is not true. Yeah, so, so I think at one point we already have conversations about uh, maybe, like you said, the, the struggle within the struggle. But then you, 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 you come to Zimbabwe. Uh, are you deployed in Zimbabwe? Yes, I was yes. deployed. Which year is that? I think that was seven, in 78, 79, I think. Yeah. Uh, so where do you operate? In Cholocho. Okay. Uh, any good memories about the area? The battles you fought, uh, No, it was okay, but I wouldn't say much in that area. My arrival in the area was in that uh, good enough because uh, what really happened is that uh, the unit that I commanded in Zambia is not the unit that I brought to home for operations. What happened when we were ready for deployment, the chief of operations then Major General Masego Enoch Changan, he came to read our two units for operating. There were two detachments that we were about to deploy by then. So the same Ponapas moved me from my detachment, my first detachment to the second one. Then moved the guy who was commanding the second detachment to the first detachment. That guy was King Shumba. So he, he died around his body, I think. So he, he was collected from the camp by General Swan. I still remember that very well. They went to Feira. So on my own, I was taken by Stanley Kakisa, who was one of the deputy chiefs of operations to Livingstone. And uh, when I arrived in the operational area, it was like yeah, there was an internal problem in Zipra. Of course, at times I don't want to wash the linen in public. Unless maybe if our commanders it address that issue adequately, maybe we'll be talking about it. You know, in Zipra, there used to be a time when some people would leave their areas of deployment, go to certain areas, uh, start voting each other to positions. Then they would become hostile to appointed commanders from the headquarters. Maybe that is the situation that I faced when I arrived here at home. And unfortunately now for one of my officer cadet trained lieutenant in this from the Zambian Academy lost his life. From internal fights? Yeah. Maybe that was in some internal feud, I don't know. So that's why I'm saying maybe such sensitive issues are supposed to be were supposed to be addressed by the, the commanders themselves. So you, how long do you operate in Cholocho? No, it was for some time until we were rounded up to, to come in accused of having defied party orders to go to assembly point. Okay, so you, you, are, the, you are the group that was arrested and referred to as uh, renegades? Yes, please. Uh, Labo Vicent. Yes, was it? Vicent, yeah. Labo Vicent and the other. So, uh, what I find interesting is that uh, that narrative, when you were told, this is fire, 
did you believe it or you guys just didn't want to go? No, you know what? There were really some two statements by Margaret Thatcher, who was in charge of the colonial administration that was supposed to give us independence. I still remember in the operational area when they were preparing to go to Lancaster Stokes. One statement she talked about the, the West having seat tax and allowed communists to take power in Angola. I think if you go through some of the books written before, if you can find that statement. Then on our own, that was maybe a direct attack to Zap where she said, regardless of uh, the results of elections, she was going to end over power to someone whom she saw fit to rule the country. So uh, that one affected us on the ground. 